Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great to have you all in worship this, uh, I guess, snowy November morning. It seems like oh, snow is starting to, starting to fall down, but hopefully we'll keep the ground warm enough to melt the snow for a while. Anyway, I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, we want to welcome you to worship. Uh, if you're in the parking lot, you can honk your horn. If you're at home, you can wave your hand <laughs> or send a heart or something. You know, look at that little emoji and send that off. That'd be great. And we have left you here today. I want to remind the congregation we're going to try and start taking attendance. So for what it's worth, we'll give it a shot. The attendance patch should be on one end of your row if you would sign it and then pass it down the row. That would be a good thing to do. And we'll start taking our attendance with the attendance pads. I also want to mention that we, uh, we are having our annual church conference today after church. It will take place in the sanctuary. Uh, it used to be called a charge conference, but it's a church conference when everybody in the church is invited to stay. So you are invited as a member of the church to stay, and even friends of the church are invited to stay. Uh, Dean Feldmeyer will be the supervising elder. It'll start approximately 11.30 or when everybody's back from, if you want to take a restroom break or stretch your legs for a few minutes after worship, come on back, and we'll start probably promptly at 11.30. This will likely take no longer than 30 minutes and probably quite a bit less, so I encourage you to come and stay and be a part of this annual meeting with us. So I guess that's all I have as announcement-wise. Is there any news of anything that anybody needs to share? We'll have, we'll have prayer concerns and requests later in the service. So let's begin our worship by saying, This is the day the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice, rejoice and be glad in it. strength is consulted in my God. There, there is, is no, no Holy One, one 
like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them God has set the world. The Lord of the Lord, the King of the faithful ones, and judge the ends of the earth. Let us worship God.
my mask off. You little rascal. Okay. All right. I was uh, trying to think of a children's time today, and the, and, the, and the scripture lesson today was very complicated. I had a hard time making up something for kids. So I thought I would tell you how I met Buddy. Tell the story of how Buddy and I came together. How's that sound? Well, that's all you got. All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, I mo we moved to Port Flint in Ohio. It's, it's a little town up by Lake Erie, just south of Putin Bay and the islands, and just uh, west of Sandusky. One day, uh, Sue and I drove into Sandusky, and they had a Christian bookstore there called The Captain's Quarters. Don't ask me why it was called The Captain's Quarters. <laughs> it's out of business now. That might have been one of the problems. Nobody thought it was a Christian bookstore. But it was a lovely Christian bookstore. We were walking around, and, and I, I really liked they had books, and they had toys for kids and, and things for teaching. And I, I walked back uh, past a rack of puppets, and Buddy was just kind of sitting there like, like that, with his, with his head down, because he didn't have any, nobody was kind of adopted him. I noticed he was by some uh, pretty scary looking puppets. There was a pirate puppet on one hand, and then there was a kind of a, a dinosaur on the other, and I thought, that's a pretty dangerous place for a little kid to be. So I looked at Sue and thought, I'd never had a puppet before. I wonder if I could use that in church. And, you know, with the usual support I got from Sue, she rolled her eyes and <laughs> didn't seem very enthusiastic about the idea, but I brought the puppet home and uh, looked at him, and he looked at me, and I thought, you got something on your little smush on your face. Thanks. All right. And, uh, I said, what am I going to call this guy? I said, he seems like he would be, he looks like a buddy. Yeah, buddy. So I called him buddy, and he loved me. That's great to have a home. Yeah, and I, I brought buddy home, and he started talking with the kids, and pretty soon I discovered all the grown-ups liked them as much as the kids. Because <laughs> everybody's a kid. Everybody's a kid. That's right. And uh, we had a good time, and I got thinking about in the Bible, when it talks about God's relationship to us, as a, you know, formerly Gentiles, the ones who are were not Jews and came to know God through Jesus Christ and His love, the Bible says that we are orphans adopted into God's family. Now we're also called sons and daughters of the Most High God, but the Bible makes a point to call us orphans too, to remind us that every person is a child of God, whether your parents are alive, whether you're adopted, whether you're in an orphanage, every kid is a child of God. And we kind of adopted Buddy, and he's our adopted kid, and we, we think about him uh, sometimes a little too much, right? Oh, no, never enough. Never enough. <laughs> and he likes to play and have fun, and he's looking forward to next week, because next week's Thanksgiving Sunday, and uh, we can talk about Thanksgiving then. Well, that sounds good. Uh, I like some candy corn. Candy corn, well, that's Easter. Oh, all right. Well, it's candy turkey. Well, we'll see. How about some cranberry sauce? Okay. All right. Well, anyway, Buddy and I have become close friends, and I take Buddy anywhere else. But that, I had Buddy for a few weeks, and one of the members of the church says, Buddy looks kind of like he needs a place to live, a place where you can carry him. So she made me a bag. Uh-oh. All right. <laughs> and here's, here's what it looks like, and the bag says, God is love, and it has hearts on it, and inside... This is really sweet. Inside, she sewed a heart. Excuse me, buddy. A heart with the letter B. Help me, buddy. All right. A heart with the letter B for buddy. Oh. So whenever I put buddy in the in the in the bag, oh. we we put him in like this at first. Come on, buddy. <laughs> Okay, and we put him in there. It gives him a nice, safe place to, buddy, buddy, come, simmer down, buddy. <laughs> he doesn't like being in the bag. All right. Well, I won't keep him in the bag for very long, but I'll keep you warm during the winter time, and uh, I'll bring you out next week and share you with with the world. So that's buddy in my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I love my puppet pal because he, he's a kid and he's, a, he's kind of a troublemaker and a wise, wise cracker and he, has, he enjoys fun. So when I look at Buddy and I bring him to worship, I know that we're going to have a good time because God is love 
and God is fun. Because Christ is here. We'll be glad that we're here today. We'll have a good good time because God reminds us that we're all children of God, adopted into God's family. Amen. Amen. I will continue with our worship service by hearing the scripture readings for the day. Today's scripture of the epistle lesson comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. A call to persevere. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the con let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And please rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. Today's gospel lesson is from the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. The destruction of the temple foretold. As he came out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? What will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. <coughs> there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth of pangs. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we are gathered in this place because we know that you are here. So guide the words of this sermon today that I might speak your truth, share your love, and that through the scriptures and through your presence here we might grow to love you more, to find peace through Christ, and hope for today and every day. Guide the words of this message and bless us to our listening of your holy word. Amen. I will always remember that little bicycle we bought for Brian when he was a little kid. We went to a bicycle store in uh, Ashtabula, and we found this thing. It was a little tiny bicycle, a little tiny Schwinn. And it was a little white bicycle. It had training wheels, but I'll tell you, the, the, the actual wheels were so tiny, it almost didn't need them. I mean, a kid's feet could touch the ground from the pedals without the training wheels. But it was a nice, sturdy little bike. And we, we started Brian with the training wheels, and probably within a matter of just a couple of weeks, he was riding that thing around the church parking lot like a pro. And it was a fun little bicycle, and was very, very safe. And then when his brother Paul came, up, came around four years later, when he got old enough to ride the bicycle, he rode it. And after he was done with it, we let some neighbors borrow it, and first their oldest son rode it, and then their youngest son rode it, and then they gave it to somebody else. And that was one of the things that I remember because that bicycle seemed to last. It was built to last. And it really had an impression on me because so many things these days are not built to last. They call it planned obsolescence. They make these things to break down 
so that eventually you either have to repair them or replace them. And they've been very tricky. When I was a kid in high school, I took some classes in radio and TV repair. So I thought it would be kind of fun to repair TVs and, and radios and whatnot. And then I didn't make it through the class, but within 10 years, you see that profession's gone out the door because we don't really repair TVs very much anymore. We just replace them because everything's on a little chip. Think about the telephone. If you have a landline at your house, if you still pay for a landline phone, and if you have an older one, it's wired in and it still works. However, you can't use it off anything requiring you to touch a button on the phone or any kind of command. You can't do it with a landline phone, so that's about 90% of our calls require the touch tone, so people got away from a landline phone. But then with the phone, they used to have like a new, new cell phone, new every two, every two years, you'd get a new phone from your phone company. Now they say, well, every two years you're entitled for an upgrade. And all an upgrade means is you are entitled to buy a brand new phone at the full price over 24 months. It's just not very fair. And we find that everything's changing so fast, even what we think is the truth. Because through social media, you see, there are truths and half-truths and falsehoods that are just shared back and forth. Just idle gossip that then becomes a real thing. It seems like so many times, in many ways, our world is out of control and our world is breaking down. Our world is falling apart. I say this because when Jesus came to live and teach and preach among, among his people, the world was falling apart too. And it's hard, it's hard sometimes to read these words of Christ where he, where he basically tells us that we're going to have wars and rumors of war and things are going to be really bad before the Son of Man comes again. But Jesus is speaking these words not only for us, but he's speaking it for the early church. When the early church read these words, as Mark's gospel was passed around the early communities of faith, they knew very well that the world was breaking down. And in 70 AD, the temple would be destroyed by Rome and never rebuilt. So for faithful Jews, then for those of us who would like to visit the temple, the temple is no more. That offering system is no more. But in Christ's day, in Jesus' day, it was. Now, in Mark's Gospel, this before we get to the passage, and I'll get there very quickly, before I get to that passage, this is the last week of Jesus' ministry on earth. He, one of his first things he does, he comes into the temple, and he throws out the money changers, he upsets the, the tables, and he says, my house to be a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of robbers. And then after that, he talks to his disciples, and he says to them, beware of the scribes. These are the, the teachers in the temple who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplace. They ask for the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor. At, at banquets, they devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And after he, he accuses them of, of uh, taking advantage of widows, a little widow comes up, and you heard the story, she puts in the widow's mite, she puts in the two small coins, all she had to live on, and she gives it to the temple. Now we can look at that gift, gift in two ways. One is that it's a very sacrificial gift and it's higher, more honorable than the gift that the rich people give. Or we can look at it and say, like, here's an example of how the religious people are exploited the poor. Exploiting the poor, taking everything from them in exchange for a prayer. Okay, now you think Jesus would have said enough bad stuff about the temple that the disciples would be impressed with what he had to say and begin to, to listen to him. But as they leave the temple, one of the disciples looks back to, when you look at those buildings, isn't this like a great place? And Jesus goes, a great place? What do you mean? There's gonna come a time when this is just all gonna be torn apart. And it's gonna crumble to the ground. We really, this is passing away, Jesus says to them. Now, obviously you can be impressed with that. And again, uh, because of the sacrificial system, there was need for a big building. There was need, there were need for money changes. There were need for all those things to do what needed to be done, to present offerings to God. But Jesus wanted to tell us, wanted to tell the world that God came to offer love and peace and joy to all people. And that we're going to get away from that sacrificial system where you have to come back week after week, month after month, with more sins, more confessions, more reconciliation. <coughs> Jesus said, you're going to come a time where, where my love will reign supreme. But we have to wait for it. The time has not yet come. 
and he's very clear about that. And uh, he talks at the end of our passage, he talks about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and, and kingdom against kingdom, and that's bad enough. Unfortunately, the lectionary ends there. But then he tells the disciples there's going to be there's going to be uh, they're going to be oppression to them. They're going to be handed before councils. They're going to be they're also going to be judged by the world. And it's not going to be an easy thing. But then, getting to the end of chapter 13, these are what the words that uh, Mark wants us to remember. Jesus says, what I say to you, I say to all. Keep awake. Keep awake. Look for the good. Look for the good. Now, what, how can we deal with a difficult passage like this? Well, I'm always, I'm always kind of a half glass, glass, glass half full kind of guy. And I also think I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian follower of Christ, and I'm a person of hope, and you are people of hope too. So I want to look at this passage in a hopeful way. And I think to paraphrase it, what Jesus is saying is, the world is falling apart. What you think is secure is not really secure. Every time you set up a system, a really good system that you take pride in, you need to be aware God has a better plan than that. God has a better plan. And we are invited to be part of that e evolving plan of Christ, that evolving plan of God's love. You see, that's the joy of the faith journey, isn't it? As you come to know Jesus, your love grows, your desire for God grows, and God's part of your life grows. A lot of kids come to church as a little kid. They go to Sunday school or maybe vacation Bible school. They hear the stories of Jesus. And if they're fortunate, they'll get into a youth group or some other things. They'll be around other kids and other teachers, and they'll learn more about Jesus. When it comes time to graduate from high school or go off to college or to work, they'll take their faith with them, and the faith is evolving. Always new. Always interesting. That's why I think every church needs to have children. We need to have kids here. We need to have teenagers here to tell us what's on their hearts and minds. Because you see, they're open to anything. They're open to change. But the reality is, rather than accept the fact that we live in a world that's constantly changing, it's easy to find a comfortable spot and just stay there. A comfortable spot. It's the devil you know. Yeah, life is tough, but I, I'm used to this, and, and I can be comfortable here. And that's not a good place to be. But yet, comfort, comfort is very alluring. Oh, I have a terrible, I'm just, I'm talking like other people now, I'm not talking about myself. <coughs> I have a terrible job, see, I'm not talking about myself. I have a terrible job, but thank God it's Friday. I have a weekend. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the work grinds me down, but we'll save enough money for time for a vacation. We'll get away from all of this. Oh, yeah, it's like I come home and there's fights and there's yelling, and it's, but I can go off to school or I go to school and I get picked on, but then there's recess and I can get out of that. It's not so bad. Or, yeah, it's, it's poor here, and, but, you know, what, what, what hope can I get to get out of poverty? I might as well just get used to it. And on and on it goes. You see, it's so easy sometimes to settle down. We're here today because God has touched our hearts and changed our hearts and shown us love. We've been able to reflect upon the love we receive from other people. We've been able to reflect upon the love that's in the Bible. We're able to celebrate the fact that God wants all people, every person on this planet, to be part of God's family. The end result is the kingdom of God. And what Jesus said when he talked about rumors of war and rumors of war, he says, until you understand that God wants all of us together, people are always going to keep drawing lines in the sand. They're going to keep butting heads. They're going to keep, you know, kind of one-upping power against one another. Jesus said, this is, this is just a sign of labor pains. This is a world that's in, in war against itself. And but Jesus says, God's plan is to bring us all together. God's plan is to bring us peace. God's plan is to bring us justice. God's plan is to bring us love. I would like to recommend a film we just saw the other day, Kenneth Branagh's movie called Belfast. And it's in the theaters now. And it's a, it's a semi-autobiographical film where Kenneth Branagh recalls his life as a little kid. He, he was in a Protestant family living in Belfast, a town in Ireland that was mostly Catholic with some Protestants. And there was a war between the Protestants and the Catholics. And he presents us from a child's eye of view, and he, it's such a film of hope because he remembers his family, his extended family. 
Remember, they were people of faith. And as, as he struggles with what it means to, to, to live in a town that's torn apart by, by religious warfare, he draws strength from his family and through their witness and through their patience and their love for one another and their love for their Catholic brothers and sisters. It presents kind of a model of what our lives can be. I want New Time and I'm in this church and every, everyone who listened to my words this morning to remember that we are in this together. That Christ is showing us that things break down, things fall apart, but better things can be built up from that foundation. I encourage you and me as we think about our future of our church today at our church conference to, to, to keep our eyes pointed to heaven and keep our eyes out among our greater community and believe in our hearts and in our minds that God has called us to be reconciling people, to be people, people with love, to be people that can hold each other's hands to difficult times of challenge as we've been facing and say, yes, but this too will pass. This too will pass because Christ is coming not only in the future, but God's coming into our life each and every day. Hold on to that hope. Hold on to your faith. Jesus tells us, don't look at the, don't look at even at these things as lowly as these things last one of are. There's a world out there that needs the love of God. Go out to the world if you can. Bring them into worship if you can. But most of all, re remind yourself that we have a kingdom not built with hands, but eternal in the heavens. God's love for us and for all people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's turn now to our hymn of response.
prayer, but before I put the path for prayer, I want to give you a, an opportunity to share any joys or concerns you might have to be part of our prayer this morning. Are there any joys to share or concerns on your heart? If so, uh, you are welcome to uh, share them at this time. We'll add them to our prayer list. Continue to hold Nancy in your hearts. Uh, she's doing well. Okay, we'll keep Nancy in our hearts. Also, want to lift up uh, my friend Mark Owen, who is unfortunately he's still back at home, and his uh, COVID is still lingering, and he developed COVID and pneumonia over a month ago, and it's still very oppressive. So please keep Mark in your prayers. Also, want you to remember uh, Howard Preston and and his anyone else you know that's in the midst of physical therapy, and the many 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 uh, family members and friends who are suffering with COVID. We pray for the children who, and for the vaccinations, and we pray for our teachers and for our frontline workers. We pray for everyone around the world for peace and hope and understanding. But I'm moving to my prayer, so I guess we'll get started with the prayer. Should I, should I add one? Absolutely, yes. Uh, my prayers for the, the medical staff who are going to be doing MRI and evaluating our Keep Zoe in your prayer. She's having an MRI on Thursday, and hopefully this three-year-old will be able to find out what's, what needs to be taken care of and bring her to a place of health and healing. Keep Zoe in your prayers this Thursday. Are there other concerns? Okay, let us pray. Dear Lord, you are the giver of hope and of strength. We come to you this Sunday as every Sunday out of a sense of need. We need more of you in our life. We need your love to shine forth. We need you to, to remind us that we are forgiven, we are saved, and we are loved. And that we are blessed to be a blessing. As we seek to discern and act upon your call upon our lives as individuals and upon this church and all churches, we pray for you to be honored in all that we do. Help us to say no to the lesser things that would distract us, the things that would get in our way, the things that would keep our eyes away from you, and help us focus our love on you, that you might focus your love on us. We thank you for the vision of the kingdom of God. We thank you for what Jesus Christ did on the cross, to say once and for all that your love is stronger than death, good is stronger than evil, and hope is stronger than despair. We hope fast to you and we pray for you to live, be at work in our lives and in the lives of all communities of faith, so that we might reach out to those who do not know your love, they might see your love for themselves. We pray for you to be with uh, Nancy, with Mark, and with all of those uh, recovering from recent hospitalization, those involved in physical therapy. We pray for Zoe. We ask for you to keep this little girl under your watchful care through this time of testing and bring the doctors together to discern what needs to be done, what needs to be done, and then to do it. We pray for our troops overseas and for our veterans here at home, and as we remember the veterans this past week, we thank you so much for not only those who paid the ultimate service, but those who simply stepped up and served time for their country, for our country. We thank you with gratitude for the sacrifices that were made. We pray for all those in the midst of the uh, depression and sadness. We pray for every broken family as we approach the holidays. We pray for those who mourn recent deaths and their loss. We pray for hope and healing for them too. But thank you, Lord, for your light breaking into the world. Thank you for children. Thank you for music. Thank you for joy. Thank you for beauty. Thank you for learning. Thank you for laughter. Thank you for life. We thank you and praise you, Lord. And give you praise and honor this day and every day. Amen. Amen. Now let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue to bring our offerings uh, to the, the offering uh, basket on the way in and out and to mail them to the church. We we'll continue to do so. I also want to remind everyone that next week is, is Commitment Sunday, uh, so if you would please fill out your pledge card, and if you would bring it with you to church on Sunday, we will place them on the, uh, on the altar and say a prayer over them uh, to bless them for the year ahead. But our offertory this morning is a Bless Thy Holy Name by Mark Shepherd. It's a lovely, lovely anthem, and we'll invite the choir to come forward and sing Bless His Holy Name.
Father, thank you for your great love and blessing over our lives and for the abundant eternal life you offer through Christ. Forgive us for sometimes forgetting that you're intimately acquainted with our ways, that you know what our concerns are and offer refuge. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you and that they may grow your kingdom. Establish the works of our hands and bring to fulfillment all that <clears throat> all that have been given to us these days. We pray that you would make our ways purposeful and our footsteps firm out of your goodness and love. Give us a heart of wisdom to hear your voice and your grace to be in our words. In Jesus' name, amen.